Rosemary's Baby is a masterful example of horror realism. Director Roman Polanski's realism is expressed both in how he visually tells the story and in what the story's about. It taps into our real fears about urban living, religion, the female body, pregnancy, and most of all, loss of control. The 1968 film set the tone for other horror realist classics to follow, The Exorcist and The Omen. Today's average horror movie revolves around special effects and gory shocks, but the horror realism of Rosemary's Baby relies on a slow build of tension, precise character portrayals, long camera takes, embedded social commentary, and masterful use of point of view to represent psychological states. As we watch Mia Farrow's young Manhattanite housewife Rosemary discover that she's given birth to the spawn of Satan, our terror results not just from believing what we're watching, but also from believing it could happen to us. What have you done to its eyes? I saw that showing uh, the baby would be a great mistake. <laughs> I never did show it. And uh, there is a, a subliminal moment when she remembers the eyes she saw in her dream. But other than that, the film is totally realistic. There is nothing supernatural in the film. And everything that occurred could have happened in real life. Polanski's style, executed by cinematographer William Fraker, creates the realistic atmosphere through long takes that don't call attention to themselves. This uncut camera work makes us feel that reality continues outside of the frame. This style represents mise-en-scene filmmaking, where the camera creates meaning by moving through space, as opposed to montage-style filmmaking, which creates meaning through cuts. These long takes also absorb us in Rosemary's point of view. We're always grounded in Rosemary's eyes, never allowed to see beyond what she does. Like her, we're piecing together clues and kept in the dark. When we're not looking through Rosemary's eyes, we're looking at her. The frequent close-ups of her face keep us in tune with what she's seeing and feeling, Rosemary's Baby is a story about control. Through his fluid camera and disciplined focus on Rosemary's point of view, Polanski makes us emotionally understand that Rosemary is not in control, and by extension, neither are we. Lack of control weaves together the real horror of every aspect of Rosemary's situation, from the way her husband talks to her, to the systematic way she's denied important information about her body, to not being able to keep neighbors out of her own space. In her constrained existence as the traditional housewife, Rosemary is treated dismissively like a child. She's constantly tolerating what she doesn't like. For a modern viewer, it's hard not to get a little frustrated with Rosemary. Because stop drinking that stupid drink, woman. Minnie Kastovets is clearly giving you devil herbs. And why are you wearing the gross-smelling necklace when you hate it? And you know that suicidal woman was wearing it when she jumped out of the window. All of Rosemary's instincts are telling her no, but she continues to acquiesce. Rosemary's submissive attitude reflects the very real power of the patriarchy, both then and now. Look at the way her husband Guy feels he's allowed to bully her and attack her character for not liking a dessert. To explain her deep scratches from the satanic ritual, Guy shockingly claims he had rough sex with Rosemary while she was passed out, as if sexual violence and rape are condoned, as long as it's your husband. I didn't want to miss baby night. You... And a couple of my nails were ragged. Dr. Saperstein keeps telling her not to read books, as if this would be a ridiculous thing for a woman to do. I thought you weren't going to read books. Don't read books. I don't think you ought to read any more of that. And Guy also takes away Rosemary's book when she's getting too close to the truth, an action that alludes to the age-old practice of disempowering women by depriving them of education. Also note that he places the forbidden book on top of treatises about male and female sexual behavior, underlining the film's focus on how male society co-ops female sexuality and the pregnant female body. Even Dr. Hill, who's not one of the Satanists, responds to Rosemary's despairing plea for help by of course calling the very husband and male doctor who've driven her to a state of terror. Notably, we can read this film in very different ways. So, we can read Rosemary's struggle to reclaim her own body as a feminist critique of the patriarchy, and a defense of the pill or the need for abortion in cases of dangerous pregnancy. But we can also interpret the film as the opposite, a defense of conservative family values based on Rosemary's final inability to reject her baby, despite the harrowing circumstances of her impregnation. Likewise, Rosemary's physical transformation also supports opposing interpretations, 
At the start, like her childish lullaby over the opening credits, Rosemary's girlish pigtails and yellow dresses make her appear as a little girl. She's innocent, even babyish. During her pregnancy, Rosemary is increasingly defeminized, with a fading complexion and a boyish haircut. On one level, if we read her drained masculine appearance as signs of the evil within her, the movie could be equating health with traditional femininity and suggesting Rosemary's unwomanly looks are inherently sinister. Or the change could also be subversively positive. I, I've been to Vidal Sassoon. It's Vidal Sassoon. It's very in. Her radical, fashion-forward new look could represent her painful awakening as she becomes an adult with her eyes open. Her babyish passivity departs with her lost girlish appearance. That would explain why her domineering husband hates the new haircut. You look great. It's that haircut that looks awful. It's a testament to the complex writing, adapted faithfully from Ira Levin's novel, that the film holds up to varied interpretations. We see what we want to see. Because more than sending a definitive political message, the film's aim is to dramatize our deepest fears, involving sexuality and the female body. If you're a woman, this movie may make you terrified to ever let a man near you again, let alone get pregnant. Rosemary's pain exaggerates the way in which any pregnancy is, on the literal level, an invasion by a foreign entity. And most fundamentally, this movie dramatizes the most basic fear of every pregnant woman, that something is wrong. Whether Rosemary's baby is radically feminist, misogynistic, or a little bit of both, it undeniably captures the terror of being robbed of power over one's own body. The story captures another underlying real fear in its portrayal of dense city living and the stress of existing in close intimacy with so many strangers. Rosemary's urban paranoia is embodied in the grotesque appearances of her intrusive neighbors, the Castavets. Polanski exaggerates the urban irritations of overcrowding, noise, lack of privacy, and annoying neighbors in an extreme, over-the-top sensory depiction of the strains of city living. Equally real is the portrait of city ambition and the ugly human habit of foregoing our morality and ideals while trying to get ahead. Rosemary's fame-obsessed, self-absorbed husband Guy, played by John Cassavetes, evidently doesn't think twice before offering his wife's body to the Satanists in exchange for getting acting roles. As we see here, he takes to Roman Castavets in their very first meeting. I'm gonna go over there again tomorrow night and hear some more. You are? And Rosemary's desires also make her complicit. She lets her longing for a baby and a big lovely apartment blind her to what her husband really is. Meanwhile, the film's over-the-top satanic elements are balanced with a realist portrait of how religious ideas and guilt can shape our behavior. The film arguably links Rosemary's Catholic upbringing, which Mia Farrow also shared, to Rosemary's lack of assertiveness. Oh, you're not religious, my dear, are you? I, I was brought up a Catholic. In the dream sequence, she asks for forgiveness from the Pope while being raped by Satan. She resists rejecting her terrible doctor, partially it seems because she's afraid a better doctor might tell her she needs an abortion. I won't have an abortion. Rosemary is increasingly shown in the traditional colors of the Virgin Mary, blue and white, representing loyalty and purity. Yet again, the Mary imagery underlines her passivity and submissiveness. She's deferring to greater powers without question. The fear of one's body being invaded, impregnated, by the most evil spirit mirrors a Catholic girl's fear of doing wrong. Again, here the story exaggerates a common fear. In light of our closeness to Rosemary's point of view and her subconscious, we have to acknowledge that Rosemary could be an unreliable narrator. The uh, idea of devil could be conceived as Rosemary's folly. It could have been all question of her paranoia, of her suspicions during the pregnancy and postpartum craze. As Polanski suggests, the realism of the story doesn't hinge on whether the devil has actually impregnated Rosemary. It lies in the story's eerie relevance to our lives. The realistic fear of Rosemary's baby becomes even more terrifying in light of the real-life tragedies that followed. A year after the movie's 1968 release, Polanski's pregnant wife, Sharon Tate, and her unborn child were murdered by Charles Manson cult followers. And in 1980, John Lennon was killed outside the Dakota Building, the film's shooting location for the eccentric Bramford. In another eerie connection, the Manson murderers also took inspiration from the Beatles' Helter Skelter. 
These strange yet true events reinforce that if the concept of having the devil's baby sounds far-fetched, the realized film is all too familiar. Along with Rosemary, we are trapped and controlled, held captive in an apartment, a society, and a body which turn on her and take away her power to decide her life. We feel her pain, 